Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. With this Value U Academy installment, we're going to take a look at how to utilize some of the various valuation metrics you see in FastGraphs. I'm going to ask Nathan Mock to do that for us, and I want to thank Bill Kay for giving us some insights into how those metrics are created. But now, let's let Nathan take a stab at showing you how you can utilize those metrics to make good and rational, intelligent valuation decisions. Nathan? Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, I want to take a look at why the fast graphs valuation lines are drawn the way that they are. And so we'll take a look at fast graphs here in a second. But, you know, one thing about using valuation ratios to help us with value is it's pretty easy to see what a current ratio is. It's a little bit hard to know if the current ratio, something like a price to earnings, is the right or fair ratio. And so we can look at the past and see how the market has usually priced earnings for a firm. And we can also take a look at projections and see how different ratios and different projections of fundamentals will look for price. And we can kind of use all this information together to help us make a decision. But the lines and fast graphs, you'll see a blue line and an orange line. And we're going to take a look at those uh, real quick to get a sense of what these valuation lines look like. So here we have Oracle, and we've got this for the last 15 years, and you'll see the blue line is the normal PE, and the normal PE is based off of, a, of an average for Oracle over this period. And then this 15 uh, depends on the growth rate of the firm, but it's kind of a guideline, a reference line, and overall general guidance. And you can see in the case of Oracle, both of these are actually pretty close to 15, and there's you know quite a bit of overlap there. If we take a look at a, another firm like Amazon over time, you can see the orange line drawn at the default at 15. You can see a normal of much, much higher of 130. If we kind of focus this into maybe like the last 10 years for Amazon, you actually get a really, really high 257 normal PE you get this default line still at this 15, you can see the price is somewhere in between. And so the question is, you know, why the 15? Why the 257? How do we know which one is better suited to reality? Which one's gonna help us make projections into the future? And on that note, I think it makes sense to think a little bit about earnings yields. So just quickly, the definition of the earnings yield, these two different formulas lead to the same result. I'll show an example of that. But the earnings yield just takes the earnings per share and divides by the price. So it's just the inverse of the price to earnings ratio, okay? And so the earnings yield is one divided by the PE ratio. It's another way of looking at this. But if you had a firm with earnings per share of $2 and a price of 30, that would mean, you know, price divided by earnings in that case, 30 divided by two would give you 15, a price to earnings of 15. So the earnings yield is either just EPS divided by price, two divided by 30, 6.7% or one divided by the PE ratio, which is also 6.7%. So you get the same result either way with the earnings yield. And so different PE ratios imply different earnings yields. And so a PE of 10 gets you an earnings yield of 10%. A PE of 25 gets you an earnings yield of 4%. So the higher the PE, the lower the earnings yield. There's a specific trade-off because of this uh, definition of earnings yields. But one way of thinking about earnings yield is how much bang for your buck are you getting as an investor for every dollar of earnings that the firm generates, right? You get more bang for your buck if you pay a lower price. In other words, if you have a lower price to earnings ratio, you get a higher yield on that. So this is you know, another way of looking at these price to earnings ratios. And if you think back to the orange line, the default that we see on fast graphs is often to that PE of 15, which is the 6.7% earnings yield. And the reason for that is because history has shown us that that's a pretty reasonable approximation in many cases and to the market overall. So that's really why we've looked at it. And so the big question is, you know, does it really work? That's the theory of why it should work. And we say that it's based off of history, but let's take a look at some actual examples and see if it really did work. The first thing I wanna take a look at is the Schiller PE ratio. So this is the PE ratio for the market at large. And you can see, first of all, that the average PE ratio going back a long time in history 
is about 16.7 and the median is about 15.8. So again, where does this 15 number come from? That's kind of where it comes from. And you can see that the average ratio in the Schiller PE has oscillated quite a bit. Starting about 1990, you know, maybe the average has been a little bit higher because of some spikes. Right now we're at a fairly high point on this. Uh, but you know, People will sometimes say, well, maybe the number should be a little bit higher. The average should be maybe closer to 20. That depends on the time horizon you're looking at it. But as a rough you know, approximation, 15 maybe makes some sense. When we go back again and take a look at a company like Oracle, what we see is in this case, this is the full period. So you can see that the normal PE over this point was a little bit higher because of some higher multiples earlier in the time horizon. But look at how the stock price tracks the orange line, which would say if the earnings were priced at this default level, this default of 15, this is what we'd expect the price to be. Well, there have been some times where it's been below the line. There have been some times where it's been above the line. But by and large, it's tracked the line pretty well. And we just saw with the Schiller PE that this holds for the market overall. So that doesn't mean that all firms are going to trade a, a PE of 15 at any given time. And some firms might stay at ratios quite a bit above that for a period of time. Some firms may stay at a ratio below that for a period of time. The items that really drive short-term deviations is kind of the overall pricing mood of the market. So our overall ratio is high or low. And then some firm specific elements. And one of the big drivers of firm specific changes is related to growth. So let's take it another example of NetApp. And so this is over the last 12 years. And you can see that price is kind of bounced around, but the normal PE has been again, pretty close to this reference point of 15. And the question is, does it explain what's actually happened with NetApp? And you can see, well, there have been some points where the price was below and the price was above. And right now we're at a place that's below. The question, though, really is we do care about what's happened in the past because it can inform us about how well this method works and how well this theory actually works. But, of course, we can only really invest in the future. And so we want to know this line says, you know, what if the earnings go the way that they're projected to go and we price at this 15 point, this gives us an implied return. We want to know, is that something we can trust? And so let's take a look though, back testing this at some points in history. So we see that when the price point meets the orange line, that means that it's trading at about a 15 price to earnings multiple. So at times we were right about there. But then look at some times where we were below the line and NetApp was trading at about a 10 multiple and then a 12 multiple and an 11 multiple. Okay, around this 2016 period. Well, it eventually came back to the 15 point. But also notice that the growth at this point, the change in earnings at this point was negative. And so firm specific factors like growth, especially if there's some changes and it's not just a steady increase in earnings, you can see some different multiples that might make sense besides 15. So if a firm is going to have slower than typical firm growth or negative growth, then maybe a multiple of 15 doesn't make sense and we should see a lower multiple. Or if the growth is going to be higher than 15%, kind of higher than normal, then maybe we need a higher multiple. And that's kind of what we're looking at. So look at when NetApp got above the 15 multiple up into the 20s here. Look at the growth rate in 18 and 19, 27 and 30 percent. Really, that was starting in 17 with these bigger growth. So growth got to be larger. And so the multiple expanded. Growth moved negative the multiple contracted. So there is definitely seems to be a link to this, but overall you have some periods of negative growth, you have some periods of higher growth, and overall the line has historically explained things fairly well. Right now we're below the line, which might indicate undervalued, but also notice that we have had some negative earnings growth here. So there might be good reason that we're below the line. Again, the question is really, what about the future? Well, if we go to forecasting and we take a look at this particular firm, you can take a look at what if they get back to kind of a normal range multiple of something like a 15 and they hit their earnings targets. Well, that tells you over this projection period, you got a total annual return of about 15%. And so it does give you some idea of what might be a reasonable reference point. 
And the reason that these lines are drawn the way they are is based on past experience. And to the extent that the future is similar to the past, we think this can be pretty reliable. So that's a little bit on the why of the way that the lines are drawn on fast graphs. And then the question really is on a firm by firm basis, how does that combine with projections of future earnings? How does that relate to growth? And we can start taking these different pieces of the puzzle and putting them together to help us make a decision.